on the fourth day of the eighth annual Startup Boston Week. I am Harish, and uh, I will be your host for today. A, a huge thank you again for Suffolk University for hosting our conference for the second consecutive year. As you may have noticed arriving, this downtown location of Suffolk University is the perfect hub for exploring Boston's innovation ecosystem and learning from industry leaders. The goal behind Startup Boston Week is to connect the entire Greater Boston and New England startup community across all industries, all startup departments, all bootstrap and funding stages for five days of learning and connecting with one another. The team that creates Startup Boston Week is primarily volunteer and all the folks working the conference today are volunteering their time as well. So thank you for attending this conference. It is a labor of love and we appreciate you playing a role in shaping our startup community. Thank you once again, and I'll pass it on to the speakers. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Jessica Wojten, and I am CEO and co-founder of WTG Biotech. In this session, we're going to discuss the power of hackathons and the power of communal growth as well. Um, I am going to let everybody do the honors of their own introduction, because I couldn't do it any justice. You guys are amazing. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kim, and I'm actually a student here at Suffolk University studying computer science. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Claude Arnell Milhouse, and I am a software engineer entrepreneur at my core. And su some successes have led me to launching my own venture capital investment firm, angel firm, and startup accelerator. And I'm also a former entrepreneur in residence at Brown University. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm a software developer, been working in startups for around 10 years. I started my career as an intern at a startup, and the company grew as I grew. I became a manager, the company went public, and now I am started at a new company uh, called Cake, where I lead our platform team. So first things first, I know we have a small group today, but if you can, can you raise your hand if you know what a hackathon is or if you've ever heard of it before? Okay, cool. Um, I figured I'd start off with the Merriam-Webster definition, which is um, an event in which computer programmers collaborate intensively with one another and sometimes with people in other specialties over a relatively short period of time to create code, usually for new software product or service. That's too much. So uh, I'm going to say that they're kind of right. Hackathons are one, two, or three day long um, events that challenge people to solve problems by utilizing their unique individual talents, skills, and experiences. It's kind of a race to solve a problem while you're learning and empowering others with new perspectives and resources. So how would you guys describe it in your own words? OK. <laughs> yeah, in my own words, is a place to learn. Uh, I initially went there, started going to Hackathon was because I needed portfolios to put on my resume as I was applying for internships. And I found it as more than a place to just collaborate with people to learn stuff, but also to build a community there as well. So just more than what it says on paper, I think. That's great. Yeah. Love that definition. And for me, hackathons are places where you can experiment wildly and you can expand your philosophical curiosities, a lot of which I'll be talking about today. You can expand your mindset and your world view to really reach your potential and to test your limits. Um, for me, hackathons are about building and connecting. I, I've always had a lot of fun working with people I've never worked with before learning new skills, um, and at the end, presenting on what we've built is always really fun, sharing what we've accomplished as a team. That's awesome. That's very inspiring. Merriam-Webster did not do hackathons justice, I'll nope. tell you that. <laughs> um, so before we hop into some of the questions for our panelists, I want to remind everybody that if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand throughout the panel. But for auditory accessibility for people in this room and online, just wait for the microphone to start your question. We'd love to hear it. Um, so the first question I have for you guys is, how can hackathons contribute to skill development and learning within diverse teams? As we, are, we all know that hackathons are just more 
for everybody and not so much people who know computer science or are software engineers. So when you go to hackathons, you see and meet people from different fields. You can get someone who's done business or someone who's mm -hmm. done marketing. So you also learn some stuff from them as well. And as someone who does computer science, I have the task of conveying my technical skills to the other participants that were there. So I feel like as a development side, it's more helps you develop your soft skills as well as your technical skills as well. Because I also got experiments on some new technologies that I didn't know and learned from other people while I was there as well. Excellent. So I think there are two types of skills that are developed during hackathons. They're concrete skills, like when you're, you're learning this new technology or this particular programming language, how, do you, how can you integrate this new API that's you know, just been released into the wild? And those are really, really great things, but I believe that the underlying skills are more abstract. And that's the reason for hackathons. It's easy to miss the underlying skill for hackathons because we're so caught up in the moment, but I don't think we should become prisoners of the moment. Hey, there's this hackathon to do this, the hackathon to do that, versus really allowing yourself to say, what type of impact can I have on this planet? How big of an idea, how big of a problem can I find, can I solve? And I believe as we do those things, the skills, the tools are less important, but very, very much so important in the technical side. But as we look at the abstract and philosophical aspects of what hackathons are for, and, and I love hackathons. I think they're, you know, when they, were, when they were asking, you know, where would you like to participate? this was the panel because hackathons are absolutely amazing and as we get into this panel discussion we'll see how they've transformed the world i think one of the most important skills that you develop participating especially in a lot a lot of hackathons is focus and teamwork mm -hmm. you only have 24 48 hours to build something that works is polished you're showing it to a bunch of people and in order to do that successfully, you really have to think about what things are actually important that we can actually build feasibly within this limited time period. And often you're working with people that you've never worked with before, so you have to learn quickly how to adapt to other people's communication styles. You have to learn how you, your strengths and your partners, your teammates' strengths complement each other. Um, it's really really fun to, to get to practice that in a place where that's kind of the main thing that you're doing. Yeah, I love all of those responses. And um, Ian, I think you had a great point that um, there's so many opportunities and experiences and that you're talking with a lot of people. So what kind of mindset should you have to kind of maximize that learning and those networking opportunities? Um, I would say just focusing on like no, going in with intention, I think is the most important thing. Um, if you kind of come in and you're not really sure what exactly you're looking for, if you're keeping an open mind and say, oh, I just want to have fun or I want to learn or I want to work with people that I've never worked with before, um, that openness I think will, will carry you. And um, it doesn't have to, if you're, if you're on the more competitive side, um, like there are definitely specific things that I would advise you to do if you are trying to win. Um, but if you're just there to have fun and participate, I think that's also really, really valuable. Can Kalag, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would say it is, they are extremely fun, especially when you, when you get past your first, second, or third hackathon, you begin to develop this cadence and understanding of networking, communicating with other people, identifying who you want to work with in terms of teams. And hackathons really bring about this collision of atoms, right, that have this exponential release of energy in a form of thought ideation. So I, I think that there, it's, you have to participate in more than one travel to do hackathons. Once you do, you'll start 
you'll become addicted to the idea of this interdisciplinary and interconnectedness of the community fabric that we have. I personally think another mindset you should go in with is a willingness to learn. And you don't go in with the mindset of, I know everything and I'm just going to go and apply what I do. But as my fellow panelists said, it's a place to take risks. So you're going to learn also from potential failures that you might get there. And mm -hmm. you shouldn't be too strict on yourself and say, this has to be perfect. This has to go this way. Awesome. Um, so what motivated you guys to participate in hackathons and how have they contributed to your personal and professional growth? Those are two questions in one, so I can break those up if needed. <laughs> well, I'll start on this one, I guess. For me, it was, wasn't, I think I'm so much more serious now in my approach to hackathons. I feel like I have this methodology, but initially they were just fun, geeky, exploratory events that you could have fun learning new tools and that curiosity mindset led me to them and how it's what was the second part how did it uh help you and like develop your professional and personal growth so i remember seeing like some of the first early projects that some of the hackathon winners came up with and just blowing my mind my mind was blown when i was you know in college and and then from there, that really served to inspire me to do more, to be more creative, to think bigger, to have conversations, especially when you have conversations with the winners. And during the hackathon, you can go by, you can talk to people, and it, it just broadened my horizon and my understanding of really how much impact that I, could, that I could have, that I wasn't there just to learn how to code or create a new cool app or something of that nature. But it was, much deeper. Um, so I'll tell a bit more about my story. Um, my first experience with hackathons was actually one that I helped to organize in college. Um, it's still running today. It's called Goat Hacks uh, at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Uh, and before I helped to start that, there, there just wasn't a hackathon. I, I didn't really have an opportunity to participate. I knew that it was a thing. Um, but my first time was actually getting to do that with a bunch of people for the very first time at the WPI. Um, and then when I joined my first company, um, I kind of missed that. And so I talked with the HR team, and we were able to organize an internal hackathon just at the company. We called it Ship It Day. Um, and I would say that the experience of organizing that and getting a lot of people really excited about just building and building with the intention of knowing that you're not necessarily going to get exactly what you wanted, but that it's going to be something and it's going to be really cool and you will have had a lot of fun doing it has been really formative for me in giving me the confidence that, yeah, if there's something that seems like a really hard problem, you, like, you know, I've done more in less time in the past. And so, you know, this just feels like a really extended hackathon and applying that mindset has allowed me and the teams I work with to build really, really awesome things in a way that is fun and collaborative and sustainable and also like full of learning. Well, for me, what intentionally brought me to hackathons was that I needed um, real life projects to put on my resume. I wanted to stand out from everyone else. So I decided, you know, let me take a risk, do something I've never done before, and decided to go to the hackathon. And going there initially, I felt like I wasn't qualified enough. I thought that it was for more seasoned people who know exactly what they're doing and who can master everything. But once I got there, I learned that there's more to it. And there's just soft skills and hard skills, technical skills you can learn from there, from learn other people. And, and one big thing I learned from there is to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Like as I am now on a panel, my first panel, <laughs> yeah, I, it drove me to be more confident in myself and in what I build as well. So I felt like that was a big thing for me. Then. Yeah. And Jessica, I'd like to add to that as well. So from starting off going to hackathons, participating and becoming, falling in love with them, it led me to, like Ian, creating my first hackathon doing a really great job with that. And then the mayor of Providence reached out and said, hey, we should do a hackathon for the city of Providence. We did that, and that was wildly successful. We did another one, we did another one. Then the governor of Rhode Island reached out and says, hey, we need a hackathon for the state of Rhode Island. So I created that. And it's been this journey 
into me launching more startups, but then using the hackathon methodology for launching my startups, even within my team. And then from there, and again, it's a passion project, that led to me launching my own investment and venture capital firm and startup accelerator. And the accelerator is real, all of this is really just one big hackathon. I think life is just one giant hackathon. And so we do, we hack for 12 months at a time now. Yep. We have these 12 month hackathons that never stop. And then we have found, we've raised money for investing in these projects. So it's quite addictive and you'll probably never have a normal life again once you get involved. I I love that idea of like it, it's basically a catalyst for economic growth and development and building a community within the state and getting that recognition. That's, that's incredibly powerful. Um, so I also want to know what are some of those projects that you've seen come out of hackathons and um, what have they done to impact the world or yourself? Yeah, um, on my first hackathon that I went to was hosted by BU and the winning team actually had designed a almost like a medical uh, website and I was just in awe at everything it could do. And, and that actually went out after the hackathon and collaborated again to improve some features and made a bit and fully launched it in a couple of months after they, they won the hackathon. So that's quite that interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have two projects in mind, um, both of which were at my previous company, Everquote. Um, so one was more of a fun project. Um, a person, has anyone here heard of Cookie Clicker? It's a browser game. Okay, so um, it's a game where you click a button and you can bake a cookie. And then you can keep clicking and you can spend your cookies to get more um, automation, basically. Um, like you can get automated bakers to make even more cookies. So somebody made a version of that, but for the business. Um, like you click a button and you send an email and then that person will buy your product um, and then you can get more and more optimizations and it was like just a, when people first announced it it was just like a fun thing um, but then we realized oh wait this actually is a really good simplification of our overall business model and they started using it as like a training tool um, people would play this game and as they would play it they would learn all the key metrics that the business cares about all the different parts and how they fit together um, and so people could be like, oh yeah, we're on this team which optimizes the, um, the website and so that affects these metrics. Um, and then this, so kind of related to that, there was a, another project that I actually worked on um, which ended up winning that year. Um, we called it Analysis Bot or Kyle Bot. Um, one of my teammates, Kyle, um, was known for being kind of the go-to person for questions and he was so inundated with all these different questions from all these different people in different departments that we were like, what if we took all of Kyle's knowledge and like put it into a chat bot? And this was in 2018, long before LLMs and ChatGPT was the thing. Um, and it was really cool because it allowed, it allowed people to go into the database that we had set up for it, start putting in additional questions, definitions, things that people would normally just ask Kyle about. Um, we even hooked it into the reporting system, so you could ask questions about like, how much money did the company make yesterday, how much profit did we do, and you could start drilling down and breaking down things. Um, that was probably one of the more fun and impactful projects, because it just helped everyone in the company learn more about how they can participate in the company and how we're doing overall. That's great. Thank you, thank you. So for me, I want to put out a few famous projects that have been birthed from hackathons. One, something that we use almost every day, Slack, right? Slack was created from a hackathon and by a video game company, right? So they were working on, they were having a hackathon to try to come up with new ideas for their video games. And as the team size grew, they needed a better way of communicating with each other. And so they created Slack to communicate. The video game never took off, but as they started to share the software project, demand for that thing increased, and so now you have a multi-billion dollar company. Another one is Dropbox. It was created right here at, in Boston, in Cambridge at MIT. Zapier, the communications API protocol, that was created. Linux, so Linux was a different, who created Linux? Anybody know the creator of Linux? Linus? Torvalds, right? 
And so he created Linux in 91, August of 1991. He started this kernel project. And he opened it up to the world, put on a couple of Usenets and said, hey, I'm creating this kernel. Who wants to help develop it? By September 15th of 91, the first Linux kernel was released. And but so that wasn't a hackathon that took place in one location, but people from all around the world began collaborating. And so there are these contained hackathons, and then you have these decentralized hackathons that take place. And one of the greatest inventions that came from a decentralized hackathon was from ARPA. What's ARPA? Anybody know what ARPA is? The Advanced Projects Research Agency. And they gave birth to something in 1969 called the ARPANET, which was a predecessor for the internet. But this interdisciplinary university military business collaboration came together. And you had something. And what was really interesting about that is that when you have high risk, you talked about risk earlier. When you have these high risk, high reward opportunities, you attract brilliant minds. And sometimes hackathons can say, oh, we have 5,000 participants. We have 2,000 participants. But I think some of the greatest inventions have come from things that have put out a message of, we're trying to do something amazing, transformative, once in a lifetime type of opportunity. And you may only have 50 people coming together, but they will, you will attract them like a moth to a fly, to a light. Now, the last, the last great invention that came out of a hackathon is hilarious, Pied Piper. <laughs> Pied Piper from the TV show Silicon Valley, right? It was created at their TechCrunch Disrupt Hackathon, and that came out of that, so that's, I think that's hilarious. I love that. Um, so have you seen any of these projects continue to be developed after these hackathons, and can you give any examples of any? Yeah, so uh, I mentioned the KyleBot project um, that won that year in our internal hackathon. So um, what was special to me about that project was the team, uh, or I think there were five or six of us, um, had so much fun that, that like, in addition to our day jobs, we got buy-in from uh, other folks, like our, our managers, to continue meeting and working on that project for, I think, months after. Um, we met maybe once or twice, once every one to two weeks just to kind of touch base, look at our backlog, see what things we actually didn't get to build during the hackathon. Um, and we just kept iterating, improving as people were using it. They would give us feedback. We'd put that into the backlog. And so um, it, was, it was actually some of the most fun that I've had just working with people that I like really meshed with. Um, and getting to continue to have that impact even after the presentations and judging was all over. So for us, we have a product called 501 Database. It's a Salesforce CRM, specifically for 501c3 nonprofits. And the way that was developed is because we started off by working with a group of nonprofits for one of our clients in Rhode Island. And we created a Salesforce platform for them. We got together, sat down with the clients, met with them, created a Salesforce implementation, and the nonprofits hated it. And so we had to go back to the drawing board and through sometimes working with clients hand in hand, trying to find out what their needs are, you can see that there's a really, really big problem there. And as we did, we found that there were thousands of nonprofits that hated this platform. And so we created something from scratch, ground up, and we've received you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenues for the platform, and we're about to release it. And that's been in private beta, and we're about to release that into the wild, hopefully this year. Wow. So. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you all good? Um, so I actually want to bring up some of my own experience. Um, my first hackathon that I did was at my school, Wentworth. And the only reason why I did it was because I was like, well, it's at my school and I get to do it for free and I get to work with one of my best friends. So I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but if I had known what it was, I probably wouldn't have done it because I would have been so terrified. But now that I have done it, I would 100% do it again. Mm -hmm. The project that we had made got so much traction from um, our advisors and mentors, and there was only three of us on our team, and there was like another team with 26 people. 
and their idea ended up just kind of fizzling out a little bit, but everybody was like, you guys should continue with yours because um, we were trying to create a robotic stuffed animal essentially to help with intrapersonal uh, like emotional connection with people who kind of struggle with that, like people with Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and that kind of motivation and encouragement that we got like, hey, you had a great idea, you could do something with it. And people who were willing to help really kind of helped me gain my confidence in my own abilities and helped me kind of harness um, my own strengths instead of trying to like compare my strengths to somebody else in a different kind of position. Um, so I think that being able to uh, kind of work on it afterwards is something that's really cool. Um, so do you guys have any questions? I wanted to open it up to you guys before I continue any further. Uh, wait, hold on one second. I'm sorry, I went away from the microphone. Do we have a microphone? Yeah, so my name is uh, Mark Zeng. Uh, I really enjoy uh, what you guys just uh, share. The question I have is uh, regarding how to make a hackathon successful in terms of like how to initially uh, broadcast the matches, uh, the organization of it, and at the end, when there's an output uh, from hackathon, how do you maintain it? And, and those are the uh, things that uh, I, I love to learn about. It. Mm. Thank you. I, I can take that question. Um, so I think one of the things that helped the hackathon at Everquote be successful is that the executive team was really sponsoring a lot of it. Um, whenever people would participate, it would be announced in all company meetings. Everyone would be encouraged to work with their manager to figure out how they can block off that time so that they can actually participate. They're not working on any other projects. Um, and making sure that we include everybody in the company, not just the software developers, like we had designers, product managers, analysts, even salespeople were, were working on these projects, uh, especially help with helping, like I've worked with salespeople on presentations, then they're just like amazing at the presentation part. Um, and then we actually, as we were getting people to participate, um, announced that the people who would actually be scoring all of the projects in the, in the pre final presentation part at the end were the board members. So members of the board and the CEO would sit on a panel and they would ask questions about the projects. They would get really invested to see, you know, to what extent is this project, you know, polished, relevant to the business or not relevant to the business. And then they had this whole rubric for how, how much they liked the project. Um, and I think it was the fact that they could, everyone could see that it was not a distraction. It was actually something that was valuable and important in building the team and, and getting new ideas um, that kept the momentum moving forward. And then the rest of it is just logistics. It's just make sure that you have a meeting to have everyone come together and pitch their ideas. Um, we had a spreadsheet of different projects so that people could put in different ideas and if somebody liked an idea, they could go find out who in the company came up with that idea and go talk to them. Um, I think just having that buy-in and having the discipline to make sure that everyone's informed of when it's coming, when it's happening um, and that they are not working on anything else except that just that one thing for that one or two days, um, that's really the most important thing. And I have a hilarious story about starting hackathons. So when I got started, I was going to hack MIT, hack Harvard. I was going to hackathons in New York City. And again, just my mind was blown. I was like, these are my people. This is my family. I want to be adopted by them. So I went back to Rhode Island, and I created a hackathon and promoted it. In the day of, zero people came out. <laughs> no one. It was just me with a bunch of chips and pizza and so I felt I felt sad I cried a little <laughs> and so then what I did I created a, a monthly meetup series and actually I was in the mayor of Providence reached out to me he says hey you know I see you're doing some really great things with technology I was recognized by Barack Obama for this initiative that I created for K through 12 stem education and so he was like well you know if the president thinks you're cool I might think you're cool so 
I was afraid to do the hackathon thing again, so I didn't bring that up. So instead, we created a monthly meetup series called Code Night PBD. And we did a code night. And I think for some reason, people felt less intimidated by that, mm -hmm. that it was code night, than a hackathon. And the first one that we did, 60 people came out. And we met month after month after month. And then around our sixth month, we had like 300 members and 60 to 80 people coming out every, every month. So then that's when I said, hey, I think we have enough momentum to do a hackathon. And we did that, and that was a massive success, and it just kept building. Now that, that monthly meetup, we have, I think, over 2,000 members now, and it's just growing and ballooning. And so you can start slow, but it's okay to take risk and fail as well. You can start slow, you can start big, just start. And if you start meeting up with just a few people, the word will spread. Great, thank you. And, uh, awesome. um, another thing I will add to that is, uh, oddly enough, if you want your hackathon to be uh, successful, a side anecdote would be uh, bring food and water and supply that to the people who are working very hard because unfortunately, um, the hackathon we went to, they did not fully supply everyone with that. So, you know, you had pizza and chips. We had six bags of uh, Tostitos chips mm. for, uh, I think there was like a hundred of us, wow. but, um, Otherwise, uh, the whole communal part too, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, having it at our school was the only reason why I heard about it. And um, we could have expanded it a little bit more if like we heard further ahead of time, like about a month or so, um, because I feel like everybody would know somebody or some group that would be like, hey, I think this person would be interested. Or I think like, you know, you should challenge yourself to do this. Like this might be out of your comfort zone, but I believe in you and I'll help you support you. Um, because that's what my friend did with me. And otherwise, you know, I wouldn't have done it. And so reaching out to different communities and bringing them together is something that can really help uh, make those events super successful. I'll add one more thing about food and drink. Insomnia cookies, really great for people who are up at three o'clock in the morning, still hacking. Not everybody participates, but insomnia cookies delivery was peak surprise happiness at hackathon <laughs> do we have any other questions out in the crowd or online yeah there's one online i know you've kind of you know touched upon it already but uh, yeah i would love to hear what was your greatest challenge as entrepreneurs during the first stages of your hackathon to startup journey Pick one challenge? I don't know what about that. What was the that. greatest challenge? <laughs> greatest challenges, yeah. More than one, for sure. I think the greatest challenge was to get outside of my own head. Because sometimes we go in like, oh, I think this is cool. But it's like a person who has a cologne and they really love it and they keep putting too much of it on but really only they love it and no one else does. That's what hot hackathon ideas are like initially. Only you like it. And the greatest challenge was to find things that the world needed or the world was interested in having solved, right? And so falling in love with problems more so than falling in love with solutions. And I think as I began to change my station, you know, my frequencies and tune into that, it, then things really started connecting because then you see problems everywhere large problems, big problems, and, but the first time you go to a hackathon, you have this idea of something, and you create it, and everyone's like, we hate that, that's horrible, tie them up, you know, get rid of them, so that's it. Oh. Yeah, so let me follow up another question regarding the subject matter that is uh, uh, most likely uh, would be a good idea for a hackathon. I'm thinking about like a war industry uh, and uh, likely it's easier to do this hackathon, IT of course, but uh, be beyond computer, is there any other industry that uh, you guys think that would be a good idea to do hackathon? 
I think that engineers are a great sort or resource for hackathons. Um, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I am a biomedical engineer, which is why I say that. Um, I didn't start in the entrepreneurial world. I didn't think I was going to be an entrepreneur. I thought it was completely just way beyond me. Um, but what I ended up realizing was all of the things that I have learned can contribute in some way, just like software programmers can create, you know, different app or have different applications for the things that they create. Um, the things that we build can have a lot of different applications. So just beyond the, uh, the non-physical things, having some tangible product also sometimes really helps benefit uh, participants when they're presenting their project as well. I, I've never participated in one, but I know um, Goat Hacks, what's now Goat Hacks today, has in part a hardware hackathon. And so they'll, there will be sponsors that come with 3D printers and anyone who has, who knows how to do CAD, who knows how to build things that are more tangible, um, are able to use those resources to start iterating in ways that, you know, software is like the most malleable material, but being able to change things quickly is one of the key things that makes a hackathon participant successful. And so if organizers can provide resources for people to be able to do that, I think that really helps. I don't know if it speaks to a particular industry, but I think changing the mindset around hackathons, not necessarily just being a software thing and more focused on innovation and change um, is how I would articulate it. I don't, uh, so I have two questions. One is for Jessica. So you mentioned the product that you were working on, that soft, cuddly, uh, what happened with that? Um, so we ended up fizzling out because, um, so I was in my senior year and uh, our school's odd, so we graduate in August. Mm -hmm. um, so things weren't lining up for us and the other person we were working with lived all the way out in the Berkshires and she was, uh, like high board member at a company, so she didn't have any time to help us. Um, but it was something that we discussed that maybe in the future we could come together and work on it because, of course, like I said, like there's so many things that could are uh, people that could benefit from it. So yeah, that's actually a great segue to my uh, my next question, which is, so what happens with these projects, right? Like people come together. Um, do investors or mentors? Like I know there's mentors, but like do investors go to these places? Do they like? Yeah, I'm just curious, like, what happens after? So I'm an investor now, and I go to hackathons less to hack and more to look for bright ideas, things that are going to have scalable potential and reach. And, yeah, so absolutely. So a lot of investors go to hackathons. We'll sponsor them, and we'll just we'll speak at them, and that way all of the Developers will come up afterwards, you'll exchange cards and keep in touch, start following what they're doing. So, because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of great startups have come out of hackathons. And it's a, probably one of the most fertile places for great tech startup ideation. Um, so I don't have experience investing with capital, but um, a different type of investment. We've actually done a lot of recruiting in the past at hackathons. Um, so my last company was one of the big sponsors for WPI's hackathon, um, and it was really cool to kind of go there, sit, listen to the students participating, pitch their ideas, and you could just tell which people are just going to be really amazing software developers. And these hackathons were opportunities to just get connected and say, hey, you know, are you looking for an internship, a full-time job? Like, let's talk about what we're doing here and see if there's an opportunity. Um, and the investments we've made in connecting with those people have paid dividends and these people going off to have really strong careers at companies that I've worked at. And to add on to that as well, and my second hackathon I was ever in as well, there was a company called Fitch. I think it's one of the sponsors here, yeah. And uh, the owner actually came to the school and is like, we're, gonna, we're looking for bright new ideas to help improve our app. And a bunch of students from all majors came up and we all designed a new feature based on, I guess, what we had come up with as a group and what we as students, because the app is towards students. So he came to the people who use the app and asked them for the ideas. So I think that was a, a good point. Mm -hmm. I, 
I also think that um, if investors, like there's not like a ton of them there, there are gonna be a lot of mentors and people who are looking to like help you and support you. So um, a couple of people that helped out with our project, you know, they're willing to work with people that have like grit is a great word that I've been hearing a bunch during this conference. Um, and that's what everybody has that's there because they're not out partying, they're doing something that is not super comfortable and it's very difficult, but everyone that's there to support you, like investors or mentors, they're gonna wanna talk to you afterwards and they're, they're basically there to witness everything that you have to offer and they're gonna wanna celebrate that after if you get noticed. Do we have any other questions either in the room or online? My experience with hackathons has been relatively limited. Um, I've been in product management and business development, and the first experience with it was more inclusive, where the entire company was invited to be a part of it. I wasn't able to participate, but a person on my team was, and it was great. The second experience was the hackathon was announced, and I thought, oh, cool, this will be interesting. Let's see how I can participate. Um, and then nothing. And then we got word that, oh, the hackathon happened, you know, about a month or two later, within product management, we were like, oh, the, ha the hackathon happened two weeks ago. And we're like, what? <laughs> no, nobody on the software teams that I was managing or anybody in my department knew that that was happening. So clearly a communication issue. But it got me thinking as you were talking today and didn't hear anything about, you know, the assumption is that this is a, these are developers. Um, but is, to what extent is, are, are the hackathons that you've been involved with open to everyone regardless of uh, place? Mm -hmm. That seems to be the spirit of the thing, the things that you've talked about, or is it more siloed and dev focused? And is that just an issue that I've fallen, <laughs> fallen into, or is that, is that, a, is that an issue that, that also exists more broadly? So thank you. Um, so one of the best projects that I worked on was actually not a coding project at all. Um, I have a software background, but the people I was working with were more on the insurance sales side of the business. Um, so Everquote for Context helps people to get connected with insurance agents. Um, and so one of the things that they were doing was hiring people to, to sell insurance. And we realized that there was an opportunity for the LGBTQ employee resource group to get connected. Because um, a lot of the folks are, you know, they're allies, they're supportive, but they lack the training to speak in a way that is um, affirming to people they might be talking to on the phone. Um, and our project was actually like with the sponsor for that employee resource group and a bunch of other people who came from various backgrounds, analysts, insurance people, um, was just putting together a concrete plan for how we might address this. Um, and it actually ended up opening doors to a lot of different conversations following that. And it just like the presentation was entirely focused on the ideas that we had and how much thought and effort we put into research and supporting the different ideas of what things would and wouldn't be effective. And it had, it, there was like absolutely no coding involved at all. So, it, and that, that actually ended up winning that year. So I think definitely hackathons don't just have to be about software. Anyone can participate. And there's a book, the title name is escaping right now, but afterwards I'll look it up on my phone and get it for you. It's, I believe it was about GE, General Electric, and how they were responsible for an outsized portion of innovation in the United States for a period of like 40 or 50 years. And their concept was that engineers had to be placed and seated in the same areas as janitors, secretaries, as any, so all the roles weren't put into departments everyone were interspersed. And it's this interdisciplinary um, coming together of disparate ideas that created all types of things. I think they were, in the book it talks about how janitors would overhear conversations at the water cooler and they would say, well, you know, I use some elbow grease downstairs to fix this problem there and it sounds like something that you're doing there at the more mechanical level. 
and they would come up with really, really great solutions. So there's diversity of thought. And if you look at nations that are highly homogenous, there's less creativity there. Like you think, okay, wow, they have so many more people than we do, but why is there more creativity here in the United States? Because we have such diverse populations. And those diverse populations bring things from their cultural backgrounds and insights. And so the more interdisciplinary you can do, you can, you can create it, the better. Another example is at Brown University, there was a, a startup called EmboNet. And they were trying to create embolic nets for post-heart surgery that prevented the surgical waste from making its way into the arteries and creating strokes, which is a massive, massive problem in hospitals all across the world. And they couldn't quite figure out how to do it. But then right across the street from Brown is RISD. And so there was this meeting between the schools and the engineers from Brown were speaking. And one of the textile majors at RISD said, oh, wow, you know what? There's actually a material, a cloth, that would be perfect for what you're trying to do. And they said, oh, with textile cloth? They experimented with it, and it was successful, and it's, the rest is history. So definitely bring as many diverse perspectives as you can to an environment, and you're going to succeed. And adding on to that, when people think hackathon, they're always thinking of coding and programming. But to all the hackathons I've been to, sometimes you don't even need a fully functioning program at the end of it. They want more so your idea. And you can even use PowerPoint and to present your ideas and just design it. If you have an art major student to design, draw what the app might look like. And all that. So there's more to it than just coding. So you don't have to go in the mindset that only software engineers or only the programmers can go to it. Everyone with their own ideas, with their own unit, can go in and have fun there. Yeah. I'd like to, to put it as a, an analogy of like concrete and rebar because you know you can only do so much with concrete. It's good with compression, but once you put it under tensile force, it just crumbles. And uh, opposite with uh, rebar, and when you put them together, you can make beautiful oops, sorry beautiful bridges. And um, if you separate the two and keep them apart, neither one will work as uh, any kind of solution. So the more you put different kinds of people together, different perspectives. Um, one of my very core beliefs is um, in healthcare, patients are left out of the uh, solutions and treatment and all that stuff. So once you connect patients with the clinical treatment and the uh, like workflow of how you diagnose patients, like that is how you reach success faster and more efficiently and uh, better for both sides, essentially. Do you have any other questions, comments, concerns? OK, there are like a couple questions online. Uh, so I'll just read them out. So if a collective hackathon is defined as diverse ideas being integrated quickly, is there a risk of reaching efficiency but not effectiveness due to lack of focus? Um, I can speak to that for another project I worked on. Um, so at, on that project, I was sort of the lead for the group. And there were, I think, over 20 people on this team, which is a lot for a company that was like a couple hundred people. Um, and at the time, I was a new manager. And the team I was leading, I think, was like maybe 10 people. So the, <laughs> the team I was working with on the hackathon was bigger than the team that I was doing as part of my day job. Um, and so we figured out how to split into different parts, and so everyone was working on their different parts. Um, but because it was only 24 hours, we weren't actually able to integrate everything in the end before it was done. Um, and so that year we did not, uh, we were an honorable mention, but we weren't in, um, on the higher end of the scoring. And I think a lot of it had to do with just we were trying to do too much. And my takeaway and lesson from that year was really honing in on that focus. And so um, to the person who asked the question about whether it can uh, be too much, I would say yes. Um, but you can still have a lot of success with a large team as long as everyone agrees to limit the scope of what actually is being delivered in the end. And I would add to that, what we do in our hackathons, we create a design thinking framework for participants. 
We say, okay, the first hour, you can come together just to collaborate, meet people, find out. Just because I think it's important for people to bond. Mm -hmm. Talk about anything that's non-technical. Talk about your lives. Talk about your cats. Talk about whatever you love in life. And then those those things bring people together. And then in the second hour, you can talk about problems. And there's no wrong answers, right? No wrong answers. And this is what the person online, person online, I see you. This is for you. When they were saying, when you have too many ideas, so you set a time limit. You say, okay, we're going to ideate around problems that we want to try to solve for this amount of time. And at the end of that time, we will take our post-it notes and put them all, and then we'll go around the circle and we'll discuss who likes this idea, this problem, this problem, this problem. So you can have this structured approach to then eliminating half of those and then you can go with round two, round three. Then after that point in time, we say, okay, everyone should have an idea. Now we're four hours in. Because there's a quote from Einstein. He says, if I had one hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes focusing on the problem and five minutes implementing the solution. I'm one of the greatest thinkers of all time. And so we really try to create this structured approach. He had a structured approach to problem solving. Right, and so if you have this structured design thinking approach built into your hackathon or into your regular life, I think you're going to get so much more mileage out of that. I think also approaching it with understanding that people communicate in different ways and trying to accommodate everybody and try to understand what somebody else is saying before you're trying to push your own ideas. Mm -hmm. And that helps push forward the collaboration. Great point. Awesome, yeah. Wonderful points. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Thank you. <clears throat> that, that was very interesting. I always thought like a hackathon would start like a, like already with a problem and then you bring people together and the way you describe it is like, let's look for problems first. Let's look for ideas, things that would need to be solved. Did I get it right? And how, when do you think about using it for a specific problem that's already existing or when do you open that? kind of forum and that kind of thinking? So, since you're addressing, both are great to have. There are open-ended hackathons, and then as we mentioned earlier, there are some companies or even the Advanced Projects Research Agency that will put out these challenges. They'll say, okay, here's a $1 million bounty for a solar car that can travel across the country. Mm -hmm. And here's a GPS was created that way through a bounty program. So there are great hackathons that come out and say, okay, there's this, we've already identified a problem, problem that we want to solve and that we're going to convene a hackathon around that. And then there are some that are wide open and say, come one, come all, bring your ideas and we're going to find out the best one. So it's, there's no okay. wrong answer, there's no right and answer. And that connects back to the other topic about how do you, you know, what's in it for the people that participate, right? Because if you're looking for a solution like GPS or whatever, then if you get a great solution, then th there's gonna be a kind of a benefit back for the people that participated. If it's the other environment, it's everybody wins from getting us together and see what are the problems, yes. right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Anything you wanna add? Yeah, I was gonna add on to that one. And the first hackathon I went to, there was no direct direction or a problem we had to solve. They told us either in the medical field or in the law firm, what do you want to solve? Look for problems in over there and come up with solutions for them. So there wasn't any forced direction, like you have to build this and it has to do this and that. You have to come up with, a, think of a problem then come up with a solution for that problem. Okay, and last questions. The ones you were mentioning, investors and go to that, I assume they go more to the ones that are more open to, to the ideas or where hmm. will you find as an investor the value for to do that? So most investment firms have their lanes that they gravitate toward. And so, because they have experience, usually. They say, okay, we've had a couple of home runs in this particular lane. And so they will look out for investors, I mean, founders that are in hackathons that are creating in those lanes. And like, even for us, yeah, I don't think that, I think we try to, we see a few lanes that we're interested in, so we try to go to those there. And most investors have a specific focus because I think in investing, it's already hard enough. And if you're trying out new, too many new things, 
is going to be difficult. What you'll do is you'll partner. We will find other investors that invest in things that we don't invest in, and we will lean on their knowledge and their view to create this interdisciplinary opportunity for us to earn outside of our wheelhouse. Okay. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. So uh, to build on the idea that Kim uh, just uh, make a point about, like uh, you don't necessarily need to be able to deliver a finished product. Uh, it could be an idea. Like, uh, so uh, go back to the question I asked about like uh, regarding industry. Then uh, that give me an idea. Sometimes you can treat that uh, as a kind of brainstorm session uh, rather than actually you want to deliver some kind of uh, uh, solution already can be implemented. So, for example, like a, a biotech, uh, you could have a couple people discuss a, a issue and then try to find out potential approach uh, to it. So that's one observation I have. Uh, one question that I have for uh, Claudia is uh, now that you kind of uh, go to do uh, visit a lot of uh, hackathon, like how do you find uh, those uh, hackathon? Uh, like uh, is that a centralized uh, place that you? And uh, the other things, uh, when you visit that, uh, visit those hackathon, do you uh, go there at the end of the event when the uh, like are they ready to do the presentation? Uh, does the state that is more effective use of your time uh, to to find out like uh, uh, what is uh, uh, could be a investable uh, a product for you? So that's. A, a kind of practical like a post like I like to link. So Thank you. We actually like the stealth approach because I feel like sometimes we've sponsored a few and but then people are trying, they know that you're there and they're trying to I feel like they're not as sometimes not as genuine. So we like for instance we went to Miami for their tech month. We were there for three weeks. There were multiple hackathons taking place. We're there as developers. We're participating. And now we are hearing authentic conversations because we're just in a crowd. And no one knows Arnell as an investor. We're there. And it, there are so many interesting collaborations that take place at that level. And I think that's our number one way of doing that. And then how to find them? Just Googling. You can Google hackathons in every state. You can set alerts in your, you can set, have Google email you alerts for different hackathons and you can have a folder just for that and so they'll show up on your radar because it's too much to try to pay attention to but if you set up the alerts that's going to help you find everything and you'll be overwhelmed with how many hackathons there are anyone want to what would you add to that one ian in terms of the question of finding great ideas. How would you find, recommend that someone finds great ideas in hackathons? Uh, so, I mean, most of my experience with hackathons has been in like really, like I haven't, I haven't gone out to like a big open hackathon before. It's mostly been like smaller communities. Um, so I guess that, I think could, that's could a great you, answer though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's, so he's connected, as you connect yourself into communities, those communities, you'll find hackathons around those. All right. Um, yeah, we are approaching 10 a.m. and I think we're on point. So I'll give it to you if you want to give any closing statements. Do you want to start? Yeah. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> no? All right. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I will. I hate, I'm like, I feel like I'm talking so much. So again, hackathons. So I lecture at universities. I give this talk on 10,000 years of the history of human potential. And I believe that since the discovery of fire and the invention of the wheel, all of these inventions and discoveries have really been coming together to try to help humanity reach its potential. And so the greater your thinking in terms of I have a mission to be a part of something really, really big. You'll start, those, those intentions and those observations, that interest will bring you into new circles. And you'll start finding communities 
around those things. And you know, I'm an investor, VC, and you know, all, things that I would have never thought that I would have been doing 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and because of that curiosity. So stay curious, but also question everything. You should really be pissed off all the time at everything. Oh, I hate this. I don't like the way this microphone works. I don't like the way these seats work. Hate everything. And when you hate everything, then you're going to be up at night waking up, typing, writing out ideas. Oh, this should work this way. This should work that way. And even that exercise of thinking about, in, like, I don't like the way those coffee things pour out the coffee. Everything. It's a plague. It will, it will plague your mind. But then when it comes time for you to have a seed germinating within you for an idea, that exercise is going to really help you blossom into something that will help humanity reach its potential. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us today. And thank you to all of our wonderful panelists who volunteered their very precious time and their very precious wisdom. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll hand it off to you again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much once again. This was a thank great you. talk. Thank really you had all a for attending. Wonderful start for the day. Uh, so you can uh, hang around if you want to talk to the speakers a little more. All right. Uh, so yeah, a couple of things to close it off. 